everyone. So today we're going to talk about power. And uh, one of the most common questions I get from people is, I've got my Arduino and I've got a servo and some LEDs hooked up to it and I'm powering it, programming it using a, a USB cable and so this is running directly on my laptop or computer. And it works just fine. And when I disconnect it from the computer and try to power it using this little 9 volt transistor battery, it doesn't work. And there's a very good reason why that does not work. And to uh, explain that, we're going to talk first and foremost about batteries. So here's a few different kinds of batteries. Uh, starting off with your basic alkaline cells that you can get in any grocery store. NICADs, nickel metal hydride, lithium polymer, uh, multi-cell lithium polymer. These are single cell. And this one I don't have. This is A A123, uh, which is called a lithium iron phosphate. Um, so, advantages and disadvantages of each kind and, and various capacities. Your typical 9 volt transistor battery has a capacity of 570 milliamps per hour. So it can deliver 570 milliamps over one hour. Um, a one and a half volt AA alkaline cell is about 2870 roughly. NICADs, these come in a huge variety of sizes, but a typical AA is probably about a thousand milliamps, milliamp hour. Uh, nickel metal hydride is slightly higher, is about 2200. And then a AAA nickel metal hydride is about 800 milliamps. Lithium polymer, uh, this little tiny flat guy right here is 1100 milliamp hours, but it's at 3.7 volts. Uh, the NICADs, nickel metal hydrides, are typically 1.2 volts for the rechargeable batteries. And then these come in a huge variety of sizes, all the way down to like these little, you know, 110 milliamp hour ones. I think I've even seen some in like the 50 range. Then you get into the multi-cell ones, and this is a 2S, which means it has two of these cells in it. So it's 7.4 volts, 3.7 times 2, and this one's rated at 500 milliamp hours. Then the other last kind is like the A123 system cells, um, the lithium ion fo iron phosphate, and those are rated at 3.3 volts for each cell with a capacity of about 1100, about the same capacity as a NICAT. So, in dealing with battery terminology, capacity is your milliamps per hour, and then the other thing that dictates how battery performs is internal resistance, uh, or what's called the output impedance. So most batteries like these, you will see on most lithium polymers, they have a little thing on here that says C, you know, 20C or 50C or whatever. So the capacity is typically referred to as C, is how much energy you have, okay? Right there. Think of this as a bottle. That's how much energy you have stored in here. And this internal resistance tells you how much, ener how much energy you can get out of it. So the internal resistance is how much current can you draw. Now with alkaline cells, typically you're going to pull, uh, they're designed to perform around 1C. That means that with these, the internal resistance goes up the more current you try to pull from it. So you can pull more current from uh, an alkaline cell um, beyond that 1C rate, but the power is going to drop off significantly. Uh, the output voltage will drop. So let's say you have a 3.7 volt lithium polymer battery with 2000 milliamp hour capacity and it's rated at 20 C. The manufacturer is saying you can pull 20 times the capacity. So 2000 milliamp hours is two amps times 20 C is 40 amps. That means this little battery pack right here is capable of dumping 40 amps into your circuit. Uh, if your circuit if you get a short in your circuit, that's really bad. <laughs> that, that will fry your circuit, that will fry a servo in a split second. In the blink of an eye, it'll be gone. Okay, so going back to your typical discharge rates, the alkaline, the one is at 1C, which is pretty typical for most alkaline batteries. NICADs are about 3C to 5C. Nickel metal hydrides have slightly greater internal resistance than NICADs do. They're about 4C. Lithium polymers, 15C to 40C, some will go as high as 60C, and you'll even see bursts of up to 120. So these things can dump a lot of juice. Um, same thing with the lithium ion phosphates. These are 
typically around uh, A123 rates are around 30 C discharge rates. So these two right here, the lithium polymer and the, and the uh, lithium ion phosphate can dump a whole lot of energy. If you want to use a 9 volt alkaline battery to power your circuit, if you're using like a single uh, small Arduino, like a Pro Mini or something like that, that doesn't pull very much current and you're going to connect a few LEDs to it, it'll work great. Um, if you want to connect a small servo onto it, it's probably not going to work very well, if at all. And the reason why is because the output current of this is probably, you know, they're, they're designed to really output about 300 to, you know, 200 to 300 milliamps. They're designed for low draw circuits. Just like I said, with this internal resistance on these, on these alkaline cells, especially this 9 volt one, has very, very high internal resistance. So as soon as you try to pull a bunch of current, that bottleneck shuts down and the battery just dies on you. It really can't put out much power at all. The uh, one and a half volt alkaline cells, your double A's, uh, triple A's, D and C batteries can power servos and stuff just fine. If you're gonna have a whole bunch of like high power digital servos, you could get into some power draw problems too. Um, especially if they're all running at the same time. Some of those servos can easily pull a couple amps, especially as they approach their stall torque. And there you go to NICADs. Uh, NICADs have pretty, are in the 3 to C to 5 C discharge rates, so they can provide plenty of juice. They work great in cold weather. They're really good for those applications. The biggest drawback with uh, NICADs is that they have a bit of memory to them, and they're good for about 500 uh, recharge cycles, full charge cycles. Um, so you really need to pay attention to uh, draining them and recharging them uh, in the proper manner, you know, in a very religious manner, um, if you want to get the most amount of performance out of them. Uh, nickel metal hydrates, oh, and also cadmium is really nasty for the environment, <laughs> terrible stuff. So they're a real big pain in the butt uh, to recycle when they're dead. Um, so from there you go to nickel metal hydride, which has much greater capacity for the same size cell but can't quite deliver the exact same amount of power, slightly lower discharge rate. Uh, the, the drawback to nickel metal hydride is, in cold weather, they stink. The uh, power output of them, when they get really cold and really hot, kind of drops off uh, pretty bad. And the discharge rate, if you're just leaving the battery sitting around, the discharge rate of these guys is about three times higher than these. Uh, so there you go to lithium polymers. Um, specifically, these are single cell lithium polymers, um, which are awesome. Very, very high energy density. Um, they can support extremely high discharge rates, um, but these are 3.7 volts per cell versus these being 1.2 volts per cell. Now these are nominal volts, meaning that's what they provide when they're under load. When they're fully charged, they're actually a little bit higher. These are gonna be about 4.2 volts when they're fully charged. Um, so once you get them in your circuit and you start pulling some power from them, you'll see that kind of taper down and then level off. With alkaline cells, when the power, when they discharge, it kind of, it's linear. So it goes, you know, straight down. So when it's got a 50% discharge, it's putting out three quarters of a volt. NICADs work a little bit different and so do nickel metal hydrides. They actually will kind of stay level and then all of a sudden drop off at the end. So they'll hold, you know, that 1.2 volts through a good portion of the battery's capacity. Um, nickel metal hydride actually hold that uh, voltage a little bit better than NICADs do. So back to lithium polymers, uh, again, very high performance, but these require, these are very, very particular about their charge rates. Um, they're very particular how you charge them, how they're discharged. Um, they do not like being mistreated at all, not one bit. Um, so you really have to pay attention and follow the ma uh, manufacturer's recommendations when you're charging and discharging these batteries. Um, the single cell ones like this are really nice because they have usually, not always, but usually they have their own protection circuitry built into them. So if this drops below three volts per cell, these batteries can be ruined. Okay, so going to multi-cell lithium polymer packs. These guys have, you know, two or three or four or five of these cells. Um, so that's what that two in front of there stands for. So two of these cells is 7.4 volts. 
and you can get them up to you know like 5,000 milliamp hour capacity. You can get really big capacities on these things. They're very compact, very light, lightweight, and they pack a ton of power. The drawbacks to them are numerous. Um, beginning with, they don't have any protection circuitry built into them, so it's really really easy to damage these guys. Um, they have a special balancing connector on them for use with your charger so that, the, so that the individual cell voltage doesn't vary from cell to cell. Um, so they're very, very particular in how they are charged. Um, you have to use a smart charger. You can't use any kind of simple wall work charger with these guys. Then you go on to the uh, lithium I'm sorry, the lithium iron phosphate batteries from like A123 systems. These have 3.3 volts per cell. Um, slightly smaller capacity, you know, for the same kind of size and weight as these. Um, but they're in a case like this. So they're, they're very, very durable. Um, they're very tolerant of, uh, of much more, I'll say very tolerant, but much more tolerant of abuse than these guys are. These don't tolerate any abuse at all, uh, none whatsoever. Okay, so for most people, I'm going to say you should probably stick with NICADs or nickel metal hydride or even irrigant alkaline cells. If you need something uh, that's going to produce a ton of energy, um, probably the lithium, the A123, the lithium iron phosphate cells are the way to go. I would probably avoid these multi-cell RC battery packs like the Plague. Uh, they just aren't worth the hassle that you have to go through uh, to add the protection circuitry and everything to it. And given how fragile they are, I know if I was wearing an Iron Man suit, I wouldn't want one of these things anywhere near my body when, uh, when working on it. They are just so susceptible to damage. Um, and if you have a short in your circuit, if you don't have a fuse on this, uh, it can do some real damage real, real quick. Now with the, with the single cell lithium polymer batteries, these come in really, really handy for a, for a few projects, especially when embedding them into props and things like that, where you can't fit any other size battery. Um, and it's the 3.7 volts uh, is really great because you can power a microcontroller uh, directly, a 3.3 volt microcontroller directly with that. It's a little bit high on the voltage side, but it works just fine. Um, and, and again, because these have their own protection circuitry built in, uh, they're really easy to use and they, they've shown to be pretty durable. Okay, so uh, a typical battery setup for an Arduino might look something like this. Let's say this is a Pro Mini and you've got a 9 volt battery connected to it that's connected to ground and to your raw input pin. This means that that 9 volt battery is working through the Arduino's internal voltage regulator. Okay, you've got 6 volts powering your servo or servos and that's connected. Your power from your 6 volt battery goes to your servo here. Ground goes to the ground on your servo lead. And you've got a signal wire that's coming from your Arduino to your servo. Your ground has to be tied back into the Arduino. Okay, if you don't do that, it won't work. Your servo will jump around and jitter and move. And you've got an LED, let's say it's on here, that's taking the signal out from the Arduino. You've got like a 100 ohm resistor on it to keep your LED from getting fried and the other side of the LED is tied back into ground. Very, very basic, simple way of powering multiple things using, you know, a 9 volt transistor battery and then a larger battery to power your servos. It keeps those two power circuits completely separate. So let's say this is a, let's say this is an Arduino Uno and it has a 5 volt out and you want to power the servo from that. Now, if we put plus 5 volts right there, will not work. The reason why is these Arduinos can only, the onboard voltage regulator can only handle about 150 milliamps. Um, if this was Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black, you would have a snowball's chance in hell of powering it because those boards can consume up to about 400 milliamps. Um, you would never even get one of those to run on a 9 volt battery. It just it just wouldn't happen. Uh, it would be very, very, I won't say it wouldn't happen, it would be highly unlikely. Okay, so the other issue with powering this from here is that these are all on the same electrical circuit. So the electrical noise generated by this servo is going to cause it to jump around all over the place. It's not going to work well at all. Okay, so let's say you want to power everything from a single battery. How would you do that? And to do that, you would use what's called a regulator, a voltage regulator. And what that does 
is it takes the input for your battery and it outputs either a regulated 3.3 volts or a regulated 5 volts. You know, you know, you just pick whichever model you want. Um, so how that works is your battery is still powering your servo. It was hooked up just like before. Positive for your battery goes to your servo. Negative goes to ground. But your positive for your battery also goes into the input pin on the regulator. And then the output pin from the regulator, it's outputting 3.3 volts, goes to a pin marked VCC, which is going to be 3.3 volts on there. So by doing this, you're bypassing the internal regulator on the Arduino board. Okay, all the power for that board is coming straight from here. And these little guys can usually put out anywhere between, you know, sometimes up to an amp. Um, so you can use them to power LEDs and stuff like that too. So how this works is by powering your servo directly from your battery and using the regulator to power your Arduino, you're creating two separate power circuits. So you're keeping that electrical noise from your servo out of your Arduino. Um, and then your LED is hooked up exactly the same way it was as, as it was before. Uh, it's a very, very simple way to power uh, everything from one single battery. Um, now the catch is, <laughs> there's always a catch, if you're using a 5 volt Arduino and you have a 6 volt battery that you're using to power it in your analog servos, most analog servos will take anywhere from 4.8 to 6 volts. If you're using what's called a linear regulator, and a typical one for 5 volts is called a 7805, this takes an output from like 7.5 volts and drops it down to 5 volts. And it comes in a little package like this. This little, whoops, this little guy right here. Um, it's called a TO220 package. Okay. So a TO220. Very, very common package for regulators and transistors. And we'll talk about transistors in a bit. So, this is a linear regulator, and what this does is it takes that extra energy that you need to drop it from 7.5 to 5 volts, and it bleeds it off as heat. Um, so it acts like a little tiny heater, basically. Um, and generally speaking, that is bad. Uh, it's very convenient, easy to use, but it wastes a lot of energy, um, especially if you're using above 7.5 volts. I'll, anytime you're having to drop a whole lot of a lot of power down um, it, uh, it, and it puts that out as excess heat that's usually a bad thing especially in a costume you know heat heats always a bad thing in, in costuming um, and it needs over seven volts to get down to five you know these are pretty wasteful so there's another type of letter of uh, regulator um, there's, there's another kind of linear one called a low dropout regulator that you can use but my personal preference is to use what is called same kind of format and everything, same three pins out, but it's got a little tiny circuit board there. This is called a switching regulator, and this is called a, a DC switching regulator. And these are a whole lot more efficient. They're upwards, you know, anywhere between like 80 and 94% efficient. Um, they also, um, the ones I use, can also get 5 volts out of 6 volts. And they can put out about 700 milliamps. So the power output isn't quite as high as the 7805. The 7805 can do about 1 amp. Uh, there is another company um, that makes one that um, a switching regulator that can do about an amp output. But either way, 700 milliamps is easily enough to power this and a whole bunch of LEDs, and you can keep the servo on its own circuit. <clears throat> and these cost like three, four dollars, so it's no big deal. Um, they make another kind of switching regulator. There's two kinds of switching regulators. There's a boost and a buck regulator. A buck regulator is what this is where it's dropping your voltage down. You're going from 5 volts to 6 volts, I'm sorry, from 6 volts to 5 volts, or from 6 volts to 3.3 volts, okay? The other kind 
is called a, a uh, boost regulator where you want to go from like 3.3 volts up to 5 volts. Okay, so uh, with a boost regulator, let's say you want to power your circuit using a single cell lithium polymer battery that outputs 3.7 volts. Well, most of these Arduinos, uh, the Admel chips that they're powered, they're totally happy running on 3.7 volt input, even though it says 3.3 volts. So you can run 3.3 um, volt, 3.7 volts, sorry, to power your Arduino. And then you take the output of that, goes into the input of your boost regulator. Ground is tied to ground, just like before. But the output can drive your servo if this puts out enough power. Um, so this is outputting, in this case, a plus positive 5 volts. So it's really good at, at powering some uh, like micro servos, you know, uh, sub micro servos, uh, the really small ones that don't require, you know, an amp of power. Most of these are going to be limited to probably about 700 milliamps uh, output current. Um, so they can't power, you know, like the standard size digital servos and stuff like that. They just can't, cannot put that kind of juice. But if all you want to power is a, a little tiny servo, yeah, yeah, it'll work just fine for doing that. Okay, so like I said before, uh, an Arduino, typically the output pins on those can only put out, or, or most microcontrollers can only put out between 20 and 40 milliamps on a pin. So you can only drive like one LED, maybe two from each pin. You can't drive a whole bunch of LEDs or like high power LEDs like the Luxion LEDs from each pin or you know a motor or anything like that. It's just out of the question. So how do you power something like that? You use what's called a transistor. And basically the easiest way to think of a transistor is to think of it as an electronic switch. Um, this is the electrical, if you ever look at an uh, elect electrical schematic for something, this is the symbol that you'll see for some of these power transistors or signal switching transistors. And basically how this works is you have three pins. You have the base, the collector, and the emitter. And the base is connected to your Arduino uh, along with a resistor, with a protecting resistor. The collector is connected to, uh, let's say, one end of your motor or one end of your LEDs, the ground side of that and the emitter goes to ground. And so what happens is when you set your output pin high on your Arduino, this switches over here and power can flow through it. It just acts like an electronic switch. It's very, very simple. Um, there's the two basic kinds that you'll see are uh, a small signal switching transistor. It's one of these little itty bitty guys I don't know if the camera can even focus on that. It's so tiny. And it's kind of half round with a little flat spot on the front. And these can sink about 200 milliamps uh, of current. So they're great for, um, you know, if you want to have like 10 LEDs or something like that. They work really well for that. Um, they can't handle any of like the Luxion LEDs or anything like that. Um, to power motors and stuff, uh, small motors where you want to sink up to about 5 amps, use what's called the TIP120 Darlington Power Transistor. And this comes in the same TO220 package that you see on those voltage regulators I was mentioning before. Yeah, so these can sync about 5 amps. Um, if you're going to continuously, if you're going to have a motor continuously spinning and it's pulling a whole bunch of current, you need to put a heat sink on this. Uh, otherwise, it'll burn up. Um, and if you're using multiples, and let's say you've got one big heat sink and you've got several of these transistors on that heat sink, you need to put like a mica film or something behind them and use some heat sink compound because this tab uh, is conducting electricity through it and you can't have all the same, all bunch of tabs connected together on one heat sink. Uh, it will destroy the transistors. So they need to be electrically isolated from each other if you're gonna use a bunch of these together on a single heat sink. Okay, the previous two types of transistors were called NPN transistors, and they're designed for uh, lower loads and stuff like that. But if you want to power something really powerful, you need what's called a MOSFET. So a MOSFET stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. What that means, it can handle a crap load of power. So these guys can handle uh, typically about 30, up to 30 amps and 60 volts. So if you've got a big motor, if you've got a big like a war machine Gatling gun or something, uh, this can definitely power it.
again the same kind of uh, they're hooked up very very similar um, but with uh, these guys if you're going to pull more than a couple amps from them as well you definitely want to use a heat sink um, the terminology with these is a little bit different in that the three pins are called a gate a drain and a source so your gate is controlled by your microcontroller so the drain is what's connected to your motor and your source is connected to ground so when this is switched on it flows electricity through it just like the other one uh, it works exactly the same in the exact same way how you hook them up though is a little bit different um, the typical models for these are a FQP 30N06L or an FQP 30N06LE uh, don't worry about too much about writing that down I'll put that into the show notes so that you know where to go to get a hold of this kind of stuff. Same thing with all the other transistors and uh, voltage regulators. I'll make sure that all of this stuff is in the is in the uh, episode notes on the forum. Okay, so if this is your, let's say you've got a whole bunch of LEDs, I'm just using one LED as an example, but let's say you've got 10 LEDs here and you're gonna power them uh, directly with six volts and you've got the proper value resistor how this works is you're still going to have a voltage regulator that's going to drive your Arduino. So your voltage regulator is going to put out 3.3 volts to your Arduino, uh, Pro Mini or whatever. Your 6 volts from here, your positive is going to go through the resistors for all your LEDs. Your ground is going to get tied back into ground. Okay, so to hook up this transistor, you've got a 1K resistor that's connected to the output pin on your Arduino that connects to the pin which is called the base on your transistor the collector is connected to your LEDs and the emitter goes to ground so how power flows through this when you turn this signal on here this connects this through to ground so it just acts like a switch simple as that now if you're only going to power a few LEDs, like I said, you can get away with a small signal transistor or you could use this to say turn on a soundboard or something like that so that it connects. All, all it's doing is connecting the ground. Let's say you want to use this transistor to trigger a soundboard. It works the exact same way. Most of how most soundboards work is you have a push button or something and all it does is connect the input pin to ground. Well it's going to do the exact same thing when that transistor turns on it's going to connect this input pin to ground just like that and it'll go ahead and trigger the sound and you can use as many transistors as you want to trigger as many different sound effects as you want a uh, very very simple way of, of hooking up a soundboard to an Arduino and then you just write that in your code just like you were turning on an LED you're going to turn on your sound effect okay so let's say you've got a DC motor and with six volts powering it and you want to turn it on using a TIP120 transistor. Anytime you have a motor, um, when that motor stops spinning, it immediately is going to send a reverse uh, voltage spike back into that transistor. And to protect it against that, you need a diode like this. It's a, a 1N4001 is very common uh, for use in this application. A diode only lets current flow in one direction. This is a symbol, symbol for that diode. This is what you'll see on electrical schematic. So if current's trying to go this way, it's blocked. Current can only flow this way. So if this motor is spinning, you've got your resistor here, sends a signal to your transistor. The transistor connects your ground. Power comes through and goes like so. Electricity can flow this way. Now, as soon as you shut that off and electricity wants to flow the other way, it can't because it's blocked by that diode. And that's what's going to protect that from completing that circuit and frying that transistor. So you're going to need to use a diode like this anytime you use a relay, a solenoid, or a motor. Anything that's going to have a coil in it that's going to create that reverse voltage spike, you got to put that guy in that circuit. Okay, so here's the same circuit same DC motor same diode but this time we want to power it with 12 volts and let's say we're going to use 50 amps so we need a more powerful transistor that can handle that additional current so in this case we're going to use a MOSFET so you have a gate drain and source 
Source is tied to ground. Your drain is tied to your motor, so your power is coming through your motor, and that source is at the ground. But the gate is hooked up a little bit differently. Uh, so here's your digital out pin. This is a 10 kilo ohm or a 10k uh, resistor. Now what this resistor does is this ties this gate to ground to keep it low. The reason why you want to do that is otherwise this gate could be floating between high and low. If this pin is set high, the amount of power coming out of this is going to be greater than the resistance of this that's pulling it to ground and it's going to turn this transistor on. Otherwise, it's always going to be off. Otherwise, you know, this is, is never going to pass with this resistor in here. This is never going to allow current to flow through here unless that pin goes high. And that is the way that you want to hook up a MOSFET where you're pulling that kind of current through that system. Okay, so let's say you want to switch an AC load. In that case, you want to use uh, basically like a relay, and the best kind is to use like an opto-isolated relay. In this case, a power switch tail too. And this allows you to run AC power, or I'm sorry, allows you to control AC power through a single output pin from an Arduino. So you just have your digital out pin, goes into your power switch tail, and you connect another pin to ground, and when this pin goes high, this turns on. The beauty of this is that it completely isolates the AC power from your Arduino. Or you can use a spark core, like I said in the last episode, you could take a spark core and push you know, a single button on your cell phone and turn on an AC device. That's how you would do it. It's very, very simple and safe uh, to use. Okay, so the important things to remember here are one, use the proper battery type. Two, use a voltage regulator when you're trying to power your circuit from a single power source. Uh, if you're trying to power servos and motors and everything else from a single power source. Three, use a transistor when you're trying to turn on larger loads or when you're trying to turn on something that is a greater load than the output pin of your microcontroller. Remember that they can only output about 20 to 40 milliamps. Four, use a diode anytime you're using a motor or something with a coil in it like a relay uh, to protect your transistor that is turning it on. And last, use a relay when you're trying to switch an AC load. Okay, so that's it. Uh, next time we're going to talk about servos and how to pick the right one for your application. I know this was all a bit to digest this week, uh, so I'll put a whole bunch of notes in uh, on the forum. If anyone has any questions, just ask away. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.